Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We are joined by Kim Brown of Hexagon AB. Um, Kim is currently running Sales Ops here at a, a subsidiary of Hexagon. We'll go into that in, in a second. But the, the interesting part I'm uh, hoping that we're going to discuss today is Kim's kind of marketing background and how that has sculpted her view of the sales ops world um kim what do you do you just describe yourself before we uh hit record <laughs> yes um i'm a salesperson that's masqueraded as a marketer and uh yep now i, I sit in the sales side but um you know there they should be one world <laughs> oh, oh yes we're gonna get into that kim <laughs> welcome to the show um first question so how did you originally get into sales operations uh, I love that question. Um, one, it, thanks for having me. I'm excited to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I started as um, a sales development rep, um, cold calling, and uh, I had worked in sales and blue collar jobs before, and I, I wanted to take a beat at, uh, you know, tech sales, um, you know, everyone selling something. And so I started as a cold caller. I had management experience, um, and I started a company called End Computing. They sold thin clients and desktop virtualization. Um, and then short while after my start, uh, they asked me if I would be a team lead and help transform my sales development department. And so I jumped at that. Um, we had a big round of hiring on my team. And so uh, there was no training program. And so I offered and asked if I could develop a training program instead of just throwing people in. If I could just do that, you know, give people the best resources. And they jumped at that. Um, and that turned into being the sales development manager. And I, I worked there doing that for about three years. And um, shortly after I was promoted to the manager, we had a new director of sales ops that joined our company. And he took me under his wing um, and uh, taught me a lot. And he wanted to figure out how do we make this department repeatable? How do we show the rest of the business what you're doing and why it's bringing value to the sales organization? And um, by the end of my time at that company, I was trained in Salesforce admin, um, Marketo admin. I'd started working with our marketing team about how do we distribute their leads the best way? How do we give all of the sales department the best? And how do we kind of bridge the fight that usually happens between sales and marketing? Um, I was able to use that to launch into a new company called Catavolt um, and take over their sales development organization. Um, and our, uh, our leader there, our head of marketing, he is one of like the founders of account-based marketing in my eyes. And he taught me so much. He had transformed their sales development organization into an entirely account-based sales model. He taught me a lot. Um, and I ended up, when he moved on, I took over sales development and sales ops and then, then took over marketing uh, within a couple of years and had a couple of content people reporting to me and just driving an account-based model and, Next thing I knew, I was leading sales ops and marketing for our business, and we were acquired by Hexagon. And now we, our product has been transformed, and we're a, um, an up-and-coming division of Hexagon, and we've got a lot of new sales strategies. So now I'm kind of going a lot of directions with uh, a lot of our teams trying to figure stuff out. So it's just been an uphill journey the whole way, but exciting. What a story. Um, so to clarify, <laughs> right now you're you're responsible for sales operations, but you're also responsible for the yeah. whole marketing team. No, um, so yeah, good clarification. Um, so I took over marketing as Catable, and then part of our acquisition to Hexagon is Hexagon has a wonderful and amazing um, marketing organization. Um, so as we've grown and and through that acquisition, um, I was able to offload to our corporate marketing organization, and they they fully support us. Um, and now we get to work together. So I feel like in a way, I've gotten a lot of more resources um, and to do sales ops really well. Um, so, but I understand the respect where they're coming from. So that's kind of, I guess, the tail end of the story would be um, getting to, I, I need to pick a lane to be in as we grew bigger and got acquired um, sales or marketing, mm -hmm. but I've got a passion for them always being, you know, in line and in unison. So um, it was easier to do that when I did both things. Um, I report to our VP of sales, um, but then getting to choose, choose which lane I'm a, I'm a sales girl, you know, I, I want to close the deals. So uh, I picked sales for the lane I wanted to be in. And now we get to work hand in hand with our corporate marketing entity. Got it. Um, 
So you mentioned you're, you're a sales girl and you like to close the deals, but I assume you're not mm-hmm. actually closing the deals and sales operations. You're close yeah. to the deals closing. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, I, that's absolutely. But, you know, big thing about being in sales ops, I'm a firm believer in that you, you have to love sales to do sales ops. Like you have to, I was listening to one of the, the podcasts recently on Jeff uh, Serlin and he says this, and I, I wholeheartedly agree that like, you should love some part of sales so much. It just drives you, you know, everything that I do is, is so that the entire business is closing more revenue um, and getting better and better what they do. That's what drives me. Um, I'm a vital part of the organization. And if what I'm doing isn't helping the reps close deals, then what am I doing? Yes, totally agree. So to focus in on today at your division within Hexagon, how many people in your operations team and how many sales reps and SDRs are you guys supporting? Yeah, so we're a bit unique now. Um, so as our through our acquisition, our, our product's been um, kind of joined with a few other products. So we've got a few teams that I support, um, and I've got a couple couple folks on my team that, that help me with that. Uh, but we've got a sales development team, about eight folks. Uh, we've got a number of account executives, um, about six or so, that uh, sell our Exalt uh, mobile product, um, Exalt Mobility. And then we've got two other smaller teams that are uh, focused on selling with the divisions of Hexagon. Um, so it's kind of a, an internal channel sale. And then um, another group that is working on selling um, all of the, the components of our product of Exalt um, in a, a new hybrid team. And we're focusing on that team being the incubator for what's going to get rolled out to our other teams. And I have a hand in each one of those things today. Got it. Okay. So you actually have like five or six different sales teams. That feed into yeah you. sounds yeah. stressful <laughs> it's a lot um we're we're all one team uh we've got a really great management staff but yeah it's we're doing we're doing a few things and uh we're small but mighty so mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. current sales ops or sales tech stack yeah um so we we're really focused on sales and sales tools, tech stack, always supporting and enhancing the process. So uh, we use Salesforce, of course. Um, we use Pardot for our marketing automation. Um, actually, as a sales organization, we use Pardot um, quite a bit, uh, more than maybe most sales organizations do. Um, and I think that's that's because I've, I've helped bring it in and utilize it more for sales. Um, we use Connect and Sell um, as one of our major dialing softwares for our sales development team. Um, we've also used Connect Leader in the past. They're both great, um, like power dialing tools. Um, we use Sales Nav, of course, LinkedIn. I always consider that a sales tool. Uh, we use Ring Lead um, and their capture tool for our data. Um, and uh, we use a couple internal tools. Uh, our product does uh, different mobile apps um, and integrations. So we've got a couple of our own internal applications. Um, trying to think, we also use a Duns and Bradstreet tool for some of our account data for account based. Um, got it. I'm trying to think if um, that covers most things, but yeah, I am interested in how you're using part, how you're getting the sales team, or how you're using Pardot in sales. Um, like, what are you actually yeah. using it for? Yeah. Um, so you're probably familiar with the term cadences, um, how uh, different sequences of emails. So we've actually built out Pardot to have a series of different engagement studios and drip programs for each individual rep. Um, and and that's specialized for each one has a series for the different verticals of industry that they pursue and the different personas. Um, so we, we do uh, regular email and drip refreshes so that um, as we're account-based, uh, so our account-based model is based off of verticals of industry within construction and manufacturing. And so we've got a custom drip program for every persona and industry that each rep is going after. Got it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, are you responsible for the data quality in Salesforce? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, which I'm going to talk about <laughs> data quality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I kind of view data quality in two, two big camps. Um, there's the data quality of, you know, where are you getting new leads for net new prospecting? Where are you getting your data? Um, what, and, and how accurate is that data when you're 
buying information. Um, but then there's the data quality of what exists in, in your sales force. Uh, what is the information that the company is basing off of to make their decisions and the reporting analysis? So it's your acquisition of net new data, but what and then what exists and what is that telling us and how do we use that? Um, so, and I, I view this as very different things and when it, cause data quality is such a broad topic. Um, so as for data quality, as far as new data coming in, um, we, we use the capture tool from Ringlead. Um, and they also have a number of other like cleaning services that help us. Um, but we also have, um, what we're calling a lead development rep, uh, whose job it is to help us on cleaning data, uh, from those batches of leads that we'll bring in, um, uh, that we'll bring in, uh, as we find out that we've got bad numbers, we've got a rep whose job it is just to clean data, um, so that our reps can spend more time calling. Um, and then there's the other side of the house, making sure that what's in there is right. So you can make the right reports, but mm-hmm. so. so they have a completely separate resource whose responsibility it is to ensure that the reps have good data. Interesting. And you're calling them a lead yeah. relevant rep. Cool. Yeah. Um, kind of a newer newer project for us this year, um, but it's all around efficiency and and putting the best people in the best spots for their skill set. So on that point, um, productivity of sales reps, I assume that's an initiative that you embarked upon to, to drive yeah. productivity. Is there anything else that you can share that has worked recently? Yeah, um, I'd say a number of the things that we, we use and the tools, um, the tools that we use are all around how do we get you know, more productive. So uh, we're a a smaller division out of a very large, you know, global fortune 1200 company. So we're big fish. uh, We're a small fish in a big pond, I guess, (laughs) Uh, however you say that. So we, we have to be efficient um, because we're swimming amongst some big players. Uh, So uh, this year is a really good example for that. Uh, We've got, you know, eight sales development reps and how do we get more when we are use all the different I explained the different sales teams that we have so we're going in a few different directions so we have to get the most out of every every cold calling rep because they're the heartbeat of our organization and what they do affects the amount of pipeline we can create and the amount of business that we can close it's we track all those things so how do we get more without just adding more people um so we looked at well you know if half of a sales development rep's job is to dial like half of their day is dialing um, and selling, then what's the other half for? What are they doing? And do they need to do that? Um, and I mean, they're good at it, but like, how could we get their skill set is starting new relationships, is starting brand new conversations, finding the right people, um, and, and driving in and evangelizing to them. So how could we get them to be able to do that more? So we explored, well, what are some of the things that they do that um, we could offload? And so we started this new lead development rep and who now that gave everyone an hour in their day, an hour more a day gives an hour more calling, which gives us X number of conversations in a month, which should equal X more deals created. Um, so, and then uh, our dialing software, we use Connect and Sell uh, because it allows us to call four times many people in the same amount of time as someone who's just punching numbers in a phone. Um, it, you can't replace that. Um, I'd rather have eight people that, that are the best cold callers in the world than, than 20 who are, yeah. Got it. So. Makes sense. Um, you, from your experience running FDR teams, I assume you have onboarded yeah. quite a few before. Um, do you have yeah. any, any wisdom to share on reducing ramp time? Yeah. Um, yeah, we've we have a pretty like aggressive training program. You know, we we focus on a few pillars. Uh, one, you have to hire well, um, hire in the beginning, uh, so it's easier to break the marriage before it happens if it doesn't work out. So if you hire better, it's easier to train faster, and it's easier to have um, you know more longevity in your reps. So, uh, but as far as training, uh, we focus on a few things. Um, and that's, uh, training sales skills. I see too many times, uh, when people, this doesn't matter if you're sales development rep or any rep, like people just, it's sales. We just throw you and you should know how to sell. Actually, we should, we want to teach people how to sell. Um, we, 
I've, I mean, you read any 10 sales books, you've officially become an expert in sales. Any, any way you read it. Um, so, but people don't read sales books unless they're forced to. So, but I've read them and how can I translate that to the people who are coming on board? So we should always be teaching sales skills, um, even if they don't like it, teaching scripting, teaching the psychology of a pitch. Um, also, like you have to teach and get reps comfortable with the product, even if they're not a technical person, we, we're technology software. You have to get them familiar with the product because even if they, they just totally flub on a phone call, if they understand how the products works, they can tell a story around that. If they've had their hands on the product, it doesn't matter how good they are. I've botched, a, I mean, a crazy number of cold calls in my day, but I, I can get back to, I'm a nice person. People like talking to me. And they understood what I was talking about when I was explaining our product. Um, so we focus a lot on those two things. Um, and of course, you know, like for process and technology and that we use to do it all. And, you know, we do a lot of shadowing, a lot of recording, but those two things are kind of number one for me. Got it. Um, moving on to the, the sales forecasting process, what's your involvement in that? Yeah, so I work with our, our head of sales um, on forecasting. I'm, I'm directly involved in, in everything we do up for the business. Um, we use a BANT method for forecasting, um, budget, authority, need, time frame. Um, but we also have, uh, with a couple of newer sales teams, you know, forecasting is a bit more challenging um, when you are selling something that you don't have a historical reference to, to know what's our close rate, what's our average sales cycle. It's when it's not there, what do you do? Um, so you have to be very on it, you know, every month um, on, on every forecast. Um, I think one of the most unique things about how we forecast is um, we our, we, our forecast category is something that's not just based off of probability or sales stage um, in and off, but uh, what the, the commitment of the rep to the business. Um, so that's an element that we have that um, I think is pretty unique where you got the sales stage, tell us what part of the process it's in, but then you tell us, is this a deal that you would actually commit to? And that automatically puts it at 90% probability of closing, uh, or is it most likely? Or where's it at? So it could be at you know the last sales stage, uh, but be at just a normal pipeline commitment level. And so even though we think it's supposed to be closing next month, um, the rep feels not confident about it. And that that will directly affect our how much we count on that revenue and, and how we forecast it. Um, Got it. And, but then when you put it in the commit, it's I'm expecting a I'm expecting a signed deal on that date if you're putting it in commit. Um, yeah, awesome. So. Um, and then from your experience managing or running sales teams, what has been, what's your like favorite or most insightful sales KPI? Oh gosh. Um, for us, because we do a lot of account based sales, um, it's, I, I love seeing the conversion of, of a sales accepted lead to pipeline and then through the different sales stages by vertical. Um, because we could think that we're doing really well right now, um, but actually, or we're not doing well. Actually, one of our verticals, we sell to a um, number of specialty contractors. Uh, when I've seen that our conversion from SAL to op is twice as high as any of our other verticals. Um, for me, that's the most impactful thing because that tells me where I should be putting my, my focus with our reps. Like, I need to put more reps over there because that's clearly winning. Um, but also looking at the our close rates on those as well. Got it. So using this one step, which is the point sales say this lead is okay to an opportunity mm -hmm. being created, um, mm -hmm. tracking that conversion by industry or vertical to understand and prior reprioritize resources, which mm -hmm. the, the hot industry right now, which might be a better industry going forward. Yeah. That totally makes yeah. sense. Um, I think most conversion rates are good KPIs, like one step to the other. I mean, everyone should be tracking those, but but it's not just a black or white thing for us, you know, where go deeper than that, cut cut your data um, and see where the real, and we're able to do that with, with what we have and it's, it's winning, so. Nice. Um, and then finally, who, and you may have mentioned this person before, but who has been the the person who's taught you the most about sales ops? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think 
uh, my first like director of sales ops, Will Sharon. Um, he's a, uh, I'm not, I'm actually not sure what company he's at now, but he, he'd be like one of the first influences on sales ops in my life. And I'm, I'm super grateful. Um, our old head of, of marketing, Kevin O'Malley, who's now uh, head of marketing at Topo, um, they're a sales and marketing analyst firm. Uh, he taught me a lot about account based, um, and then even my boss now, I've worked with him in a couple of companies, Tim Marinello. I've learned so much from him um, just in sales. And he's he's always driven me when I've uh, flirted the line of being more operational focused, which isn't bad, but always helping me remember it's about closing the deals. Um, and we always have the, have to have the heartbeat for that. If there's no revenue, you know, then we can't back up what we're doing and why we're doing it. There we go. Kim, thank <laughs> you so much. Um, these yeah. are the things that I liked. Um, your focus on, or or you, your belief that actually to be a face of a sales ops, you have to be super passionate about sales. Um, I do agree with. We've had people on the podcast before who wouldn't necessarily necessarily agree with that, but I do. Yeah. Um, having a separate resource in there to ensure that the salespeople can literally come into work and start hammering the phones or doing the emails without, mm-hmm. because if the typical salesperson excuse, isn't it that? Yeah. data is like oh, the data is rubbish today i spent two hours on the data so that's interesting um and then yeah. breaking the marriage before it happens that i think is a very really <laughs> good way of describing or or reminding you to actually be more more careful in the hiring process right yeah absolutely um I'd love to comment on a couple of those things real quick if we can. Yeah, for sure. Yes. I know that <laughs> um, I know like, and I've, I follow your podcast. I know that there's people that don't agree. I have to have a sales background, um, you know, and my background is very specific to sales development and marketing. And so it's different than a lot of other sales reps, but um, I remember one of my interviews for a job that I've had in sales ops was, you know, I love starting a deal as much as the closers love closing a deal. Um, and that's how I know I have that fire. Like for me to be able to start a brand new relationship in 30 seconds and three minutes with someone I've never talked to before, that's going to end up being what could be one of the best customers of our business next year. I mean, that's powerful. And I just think you have to have that kind of drive, something like that, if you're going to be in sales ops, because you have to get it. You have to get where your sales teams are coming from and what drives them on some level. Um, And then the breaking the marriage before it happens is easier said than done. Uh, One thing that I love that we've done is incorporating like a couple personality tests and mock calls and demos into our interview process. The personality tests. We don't want everyone being the same, but I, if I know where everyone on my team is at on like whatever spectrum of personalities, I know like what I need most when I'm hiring. If I've got a bunch of like doers, you know, and I need a shark, you know, then I know I can find that easier in a personality test in some ways. It's not the be all end all, but it helps. Um, and then having reps do mock calls or mock demos for us to show us in the element, you know, like. Hey, we know you don't know our product, you know, but give it your best shot. What natural ability do you have um, that I can pick up in an interview um, that's going to help me know what I'm going to see when we have day one? So there we go. Kim, thank you very much for those <laughs> extra little, little nuggets of wisdom. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. It was, I can really sense your passion for sales as you speak. <laughs> it, it Thanks. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is great.